do COVID-19 vaccines work in people taking certain multiple sclerosis disease modifying therapies, in particular Ocrevus and other B-cell depleting agents like rituximab and Casimpta and Gelenia and other S1P phosphate receptor modulators such as Mazent and Zaposia. Previously, it's been reported that people taking these medications who get vaccinated have much lower rates of antibody responses and they have higher rates of getting COVID-19 despite vaccination. And I personally have no less than four patients with multiple sclerosis taking B-cell depleting agents that were hospitalized with COVID-19 despite vaccination, although they all recovered. I, in fact, have exactly zero patients with any disease who received any dose of any COVID-19 vaccination who passed away from COVID-19. And I, unfortunately, have several patients unvaccinated who died of COVID-19. So they definitely do work. But how well do they work? Previously, we only had serological data, but now from the National Health service in the United Kingdom, we have actual data on clinical risk of COVID-19 in the vaccine era compared to the pre-vaccination era, and there's a particular signal for people taking Ocrevus and Gelenia, but we'll look at other disease-modifying therapies as well, and I'll show you data in general in the United Kingdom on vaccinated people versus unvaccinated people, and I'll give my own opinion at the very end. Let's have some fun. I included the link to the article below if you want to take a look for yourself. We'll start with a summary of the top line results and then look at each individual disease modifying therapy in graphical form. By the way, my name is Brandon Bieber. I make videos about MS every Wednesday, so please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. And if you enjoy the video, please click like. So this again is a retrospective analysis from the National Health Service of England. One of the advantages of a national health service is you can get really good nationwide data. They looked at people with MS taking disease-modifying therapies, in other words, medications to prevent relapses and new MRI lesions in MS. And they looked at people with infection with SARS-CoV-2, the etiologic agent of COVID-19, and you had to have a positive test, although this was both symptomatic and asymptomatic people. We didn't get any data on the severity of the infection, whether they required oxygen, hospitalization, people who passed away, no data in this study, just COVID-19 with a positive test. And this was from March 2020 to August 2021. And they looked at people on disease-modifying therapies and compared them to the general population. So the comparison is not to people with MS not taking medication. It's just to the general population. And of course, there are some potential biases because people taking these medications may be a little bit more cautious, less likely to get exposed to COVID-19, that kind of thing. But as you'll see, the overall trend of the data is quite convincing. So what are the key results? So for people taking Ocrevus, the relative risk of getting COVID-19 relative to the general population was 1.13. In other words, 13% higher risk, not statistically significant during the pre-vaccination period, so prior to vaccines being widely available. In the post-vaccination period, it was 1.79, so 79% higher risk than the general population. So it would appear that vaccines were significantly less effective for people taking Ocrevus, and this makes sense because they don't have B lymphocytes, the cells that make antibodies, so they get less of an antibody response. They do still have T lymphocytes, and so they still get a T cell response, and I do believe they get some protection, and I'll explain why after I show all the data. What about for Gelenia? The relative risk in the pre-vaccination period was 0.87. So they actually had lower risk, 13% lower risk, despite taking an immunosuppressant drug. Of course, this is probably for other reasons. Maybe they were more cautious. However, in the post-vaccination period, they had a 1.4 relative risk, in other words, 40% higher risk. So again, it seems that vaccines did not work as well in this group. And by the way, for Ocrevus, I think you could apply this reasoning to people taking other B-cell depleting agents such as rituximab and Casimpta, and for Gelenia, to other similar medications such as Mazent and Zaposia. So let's look at each individual disease-modifying therapy. So this is Lemtrada. Now, for each of these graphs, you're going to see the incidence rate of infection per 100 people per month. So in the winter peak, you can see it was about 
two out of 100 or 2% risk of getting COVID per month. And you're going to see the black line is the general population. Again, people in England in general, not with multiple sclerosis necessarily. And then you're going to compare that to the colored line and they give a standard error. And you can see that people taking Lemtrada do seem to have a little bit higher risk in general, but it doesn't really change prior to and after vaccination. And that suggests that the vaccine works in people taking Lemtrada. And the idea is that Lemtrada depletes B and T lymphocytes, but then they come back. And so if it's been a long time since you've had Lemtrada, when you get the vaccine, it probably works fairly well. Of course, if someone had just received Lemtrada and then got the vaccine weeks later, it may be less effective. But I think for most people, they got the vaccine quite a bit after the time they received Lemtrada. And so you can see there's some increased risk just because it's an immunosuppressant, but it doesn't really interfere with vaccination. Now we'll move to dimethylfumarate or Tecfidera, and you can see the lines are really right on top of each other, and so there's really no effect whatsoever. Now some people taking Tecfidera can have very low levels of lymphocytes, but most people don't, and so it seems that Tecfidera does not significantly interfere with the efficacy of the vaccines. Now, by the way, you can see the dotted line is the percentage of the population in the United Kingdom who have been vaccinated. You can see at the end of December, it starts at 0% and goes slowly up to around 70% by the end of August. Let's move on to Tysabri, natalizumab. Again, you can see the lines are right on top of each other. Tysabri entraps lymphocytes outside of the central nervous system, but does not kill lymphocytes and hence does not interfere with the efficacy of vaccination. So it doesn't seem to cause any problem. You can see with the beta interferons, these are medications, Rebif, Extavia, beta seron, Avinex, and Plegrity. Interestingly, people seem to have a lower risk of COVID-19 overall. And so it turns out that beta interferons are proteins naturally secreted by the liver in response to viral infections, and they may actually offer some protection against viral infections. And you can see both before and after vaccination, there's a decreased risk, although this could be due to other factors like, again, less exposure because people are more cautious because they have a serious disease like multiple sclerosis. I don't know. I wouldn't tell someone you have protection just because you're taking these drugs, but the data look pretty good. We'll move on to Mavenclad, Cladribine, this is definitely an immunosuppressant, but just like with Lemtrada, the immune system comes back. And again, the lines are relatively speaking on top of each other. You can see a slight separation at the end where maybe people taking Mavenclad had a little bit higher risk, but no statistically significant difference. And again, I think Mavenclad, if you took it a while ago and your immune system has repleted, it probably does not significantly affect the efficacy of the vaccines. Okay, what about glutirum or acetate products, copaxone, glutopa? You can see, again, the lines are on top of each other, and in fact, people taking glutirum or have slightly lower risk. This makes sense. Glutirum or acetate is a protein, which is thought to work like an allergy shot, sort of exposing your immune system to proteins similar to myelin, so you develop tolerance, but it definitely doesn't weaken the immune system, so it, it causes no problem. Abagio is a mild immunosuppressant, but really has no effect on vaccination. And, you know, it's not a strong immunosuppressant. It doesn't significantly increase the rate of infections. And so this is no surprise, doesn't really interfere significantly with vaccination. Okay, let's move on to the two drugs that do interfere with vaccination. So in the red line, you have fingolimod or gelenia. And you can see prior to the vaccines becoming available, people taking gelenia had slightly lower risk, probably because they were more cautious. And then it was about equal. But then after vaccines became widely available, they had a higher risk. And again, the relative risk was about 1.4, 40% higher risk perhaps despite them being more cautious. Now, I want you to take a close look at the graph and look at the separation between the red line and the black line between Gelenia and the general population, and just keep that in mind for later. Now we move to Ocrevus, and you can see the same thing where after vaccination, there's a big separation, 79% higher risk compared to the general population. This is despite the fact that people taking Ocrevus are likely more cautious, likely more likely to practice social distancing, work from home, wear masks, etc. yet they still get COVID-19 
more often because these drugs definitely increase the risk of COVID-19 and decrease the efficacy of vaccination. There's no question about it. But again, compare these two lines, the blue line, Okovis, to the black line, the general population. Keep that in mind for later. Now, we could look at this in a different way. So here we're just looking at only relative risk. Forget about the raw numbers. Let's just compare Okovis in blue to the general population in black as vaccination goes up. And you can see the lines are on top of each other most of the time. But after after April, basically when most people start getting the vaccine, you can see the separation and the relative risk of people taking Ocrevus goes up because they're getting less protection from vaccination. Same thing with, Gel with uh, Gelenia. You can see that it matches very closely. Then the vaccine becomes uh, available. It goes up. Interestingly, it dips down probably just due to random fluctuation and then sort of goes back up. But overall, there's a tendency for the relative risk to be higher after vaccines become available. Now, let's compare to something else. Let's compare just in general in the United Kingdom, vaccinated versus unvaccinated. And so you can see the units here are different. You're looking at per 100,000 person years. And you can see the second wave in the winter at the beginning of 2021, and the third wave in the summer with the peak of July 15th. And you can see unvaccinated people in Britain in green. And you can see people who got the first dose, 21 or more days after the first dose in blue, and then people who got the second dose in the dark blue line. And you can see that there's a huge difference where there seems to be very significant protection for people who have had two doses of the vaccine, much greater than the difference we saw before in people taking Jeleni and Ocrevus versus the general population. Let's say if we look at a different high-risk group, this is just people age 60 to 69 and their risk of COVID-19 infection in the United Kingdom. And you can see the dotted line is the period of vaccine eligibility. And you can see the difference between unvaccinated and vaccinated, the unvaccinated in the green line, people getting a single dose in the blue line, and then people getting two doses in the dark blue line. There's a huge difference in people who got two doses of vaccination compared to the unvaccinated. And so it does seem to offer very significant protection. Again, much greater difference than when we were looking at, say, Ocrevus or Gelenia relative to the general population alone. So that separation between the lines is much greater. So what is the summary of all this? Well, vaccines are definitely less effective in people taking Gelenia and in people taking Ocrevus and by extension, people taking similar drugs. Other B cell depleters, Casimta rituximab, other S1P receptor modulators, Zaposia, Mazen. However, there likely is some degree of protection. I can't give you a number because obviously we don't know which of these people were vaccinated. My clinical experience is that a higher percentage of people taking immunosuppressants are willing to receive COVID-19 vaccines compared to the general population just because they know they are higher risk. However, there are certainly people taking immunosuppressants or who have other risk factors, older, other comorbidities that refuse these vaccines for whatever reason. But I do think the percentage of people taking the vaccine is a little bit higher. They do seem to offer some protection, not 100% protection, not the same protection you would get if you weren't taking an immunosuppressant. So my advice would be, get the vaccine, get both doses, and get the booster. And just as a reminder, the most efficacious vaccine is likely the Moderna version of the vaccine. And if you are immunosuppressed for the booster dose, you can request the full dose uh, instead of the regular booster, which is the half dose of the Moderna vaccine. So I hope this was useful to you. Please post any questions, comments, requests for future videos in the comments below.